Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you. The format of this meeting is two 10-minute speakers followed by our information break and then our main speaker who will speak for 30 minutes. Our first 10-minute speaker is Monica. (laughs) Hi, I'm Monica, an alcoholic. Wow, this is my first time qualifying in an AA meeting. So... (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I'd like to say I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love everyone here. And I'm really grateful to Peggy for starting this meeting. I'm grateful to my sponsor, Elizabeth, and my sober sister, Maya, and Jane, who has five days, who is here to support me as well. And um, wow, um, I'm going to tell you, I've been sober since October 23rd, 2006. It's been quite a ride. (laughs) And I didn't come here, uh, I came here kind of kicking and screaming because I really didn't want to be an alcoholic. I can tell you that. Um, but what this program has done for me is, is really a miracle. Um, I, uh, actually, I'm going to tell you what it was like and what it's like now in my experience, strength, and hope. Um, I'm the older sister of two girls. Uh, my mother is Bolivian. My dad's Norwegian. You can't get more opposite than that. And my mother is uh, very supportive of alcoholics because she loves my father. My father is um, still drinking. He loves his drink. And he loves AA meetings, which is funny to say. He goes to AA meetings in Miami, and he, he likes to say, oh, those poor people, they can't control their drink. And he goes home, and he drinks a six-pack. So my father is a lovely man, and he um, sometimes is dry. And I remember thinking it was all his fault that I was like this, that I was unhappy. And um, I'm starting to realize that that's not the case. Um, But anyway, they were great parents. And I remember my first drink was in sixth grade. I went to my first party, and I wanted to look pretty. So I had my mom do my hair, and I got contact lenses, and I got my braces off and all that good stuff. I thought it was really pretty and cool. And they had wine coolers near the pool table. And I remember thinking, oh, this looks really yummy, so I'm going to try that. And I felt so good. I remember it was like a peach wine cooler. And I was like, yum, you know. And it made me feel good. Um, and I felt confident and pretty and all that stuff that I wanted. And that was the beginning, really, for me. Um, I thought I was a social drinker because I drank all through high school and college. I blacked out. I remember waking up in a dorm room and not really knowing what had happened. And my girlfriends, my sorority sisters were like, you got so sick. And uh, I thought, God, I was worried about how I looked. You know, I wasn't worried about where I barfed or anything. I was just worried about how I looked. And that's really, you know, my disease is looking good and the perfectionism and all that. So that just, this is a progressive disease because it didn't get better, it got worse. Through my 20s, I did geographics, but at the time I thought I was just moving up in my career, you know? But I kept moving city to city and, and guy to guy. And um, I was getting bigger, bigger jobs, but I was becoming more and more hungover and unhappy. And, you know, I, I remember going to sleep and thinking, I don't want to be in my skin. You know, like that itchy kind of, uh, I don't want to be in this um, skin of mine. And um, what really came to the point was my relationships weren't working. And um, I went from relationship to relationship, job to job. It was always my boss's fault, my boyfriend's fault, my father's fault. So finally, uh, in Boston, I was, I think I was 29 years old, and I was so unhappy. And I was dating the guy, the man of my dreams. He fit the picture. He was great in the in the frame on my desk at work. Um, he had two dogs. He had the beautiful car, the house, the Atlanta house, you know. And um, but for some reason, I wasn't. I still wasn't feeling it. I was something. I thought it was me. You know, I'm like something's wrong with me. Something inside. And it was that God-sized hole that needed to be filled that just wasn't filled with anything but alcohol. And so um, basically, it didn't work. He dumped me, and I had never been dumped before, really. (laughs) Um, So 
when he when he dumped me, my world came crashing down because I was by myself. And I remember when he dumped me. This is a great story. Uh, I I was drinking champagne on the boat, and I thought the more champagne I drank, the better I would feel. And he wouldn't dump me. Like it would it, this wouldn't be happening. And what ended up happening is we came home. And I remember him taking me to the airport three hours before my flight because he wanted to get rid of me so badly, like get this woman away. And I was thinking, gosh, he's just not good at communicating. <laughs> See that? It was all about everyone else. And um, I realized something was wrong, and I didn't know what it was, so I decided to blow up my life. I was in Boston. I had the perfect job, the apartment, all that good stuff, all the material stuff. Thank you. And so I decided to put everything in my convertible, red convertible, in Boston and drive across country to Miami, the scene of the crime, my parents, because it's their fault. And I just put everything I could in that little convertible, my best shoes, and then I gave everything else away, because that's really what my life was about, right? So I, I drove across country and looking for the reason why I was so unhappy. And I remember getting really drunk in a hotel in Atlanta because that was my stop, my halfway point to Miami, and just drinking and thinking, I'm in a jacuzzi. If I have a jacuzzi and drinks, I'm fine. And I wasn't. So I went home and uh, I was there for a few months unemployed. It's very glamorous being 29. Uh, no place to go, no job, no nothing um, with your parents. It's very glamorous. But that's where my alcoholism took me and with my shoes. And um, so basically I was there and it w I wasn't getting answers. It was just getting worse. So I decided to come to New York of all places with the purple suitcase. I had all my, uh, I had a few outfits and uh, come, I went to my sister's apartment. And she was so great. She took me in. She's a great Al-Anon. And I have to have a shout out to the Al-Anon girls, because that's how I came in here, was through those Al-Anon meetings. And I got my first uh, taste of the 12 steps. But anyway, she took me in. And um, she had a small studio apartment in the East Village. And we slept in a twin bed for months. And she never asked me once, like, when are you getting out of here? You know? So that's a true sister, I guess, or maybe. She also has her al -Anonism, so. <laughs> but um, it, I remember for months just being so miserable. And then finally my mom, of all people, said to me, have you ever tried al -Anon? And I thought, what's al you know, So I looked it up because you know, I, I was looking for anything. And I went to this meeting in a basement in a hospital. And it was dungy, and it was the carpet was stained. But the girls were so happy in that meeting. They had something that I really wanted. They had serenity. They were comfortable in their skin. I, I hadn't had that. I was so miserable. Um, remember, I didn't have a place to live. I didn't have, you know, a job. I didn't have a boyfriend. I didn't have any of the things that were soothing. I, and I wasn't drinking at the time because I was just so depressed. I kind of went to a state of being dry. And um, anyway, so in the Al-Anon meetings, I started to get the 12 steps. I got a really great sponsor. And I was in Al-Anon for two years, and my life got so big. Um, bigger than I had ever imagined. Um, you know, I ended up getting my dream job and, and um, you know, rebuilding my life a little bit and the relationships in my life. And um, but then I still something still was wrong, you know. And I sat in these meetings every Tuesday night with the Al-Anon girls, and I didn't know what was wrong. And I went to something called Chick to Chick which was a weekend where AA girls and Al-Anon girls come together. It's really a magical weekend. If you don't know about it, you should look into it and try to sign up and go. Um, and I started to listen to some of the AA girls, and I was always attracted to the AA girls. Like, I was running with Elizabeth, you know, I was running with Felicia, and I was wondering, I was going, wow, these alcoholics, they really have fun, and they're, like, happy, and they're, you know... And I'm just, I'm really attracted to them. And I was thinking, God, I've always dated Al-Anons my whole life. All the men in my life were Al-Anons. I wonder what that's about. And it turns out I was the alcoholic. And I heard Stephanie speak one Tuesday. And I was like, that's my story. And so it just, um, what, a, what a blessing that the veil was lifted. And it, my life becomes less and less foggy. I don't know if you can relate to that. Like, I had such a fog all of my life. So I'm starting to remember things and put things together and uh, piece by piece. And I'm really lucky that I have a great sponsor and a grand sponsor and a lot of girls in this program that I can turn to that, that are just always there unconditionally. And thank you. And uh, that's just my advice if anyone's starting or counting days is to keep coming back because the answer is here 
and you just feel so much better. And I, you know, someone asked me, my sponsor was like, you know, what what changed for you? In a general way, explain what changed for you. And everything changed for me. I'm not the woman that I was when I walked in here a few years ago, and that's because of this program and the steps and working working the steps. And um, I really appreciate being asked to speak today because that's a huge honor. You know, I remember listening to people speak in this meeting and thinking, oh my gosh, that's so cool that they can do that. And sometimes walking through that fear is all you really need to do is showing up. Because I would love to run. <laughs> Where's the back door? No, I'm just kidding. But it, it, it really, that, that was my MO, was running from everything and, and just being able to show up for things. Like I've had the same job at the same place for four years. That's longer than I've ever had in my life. And I have a relationship now, and it's not always perfect, and I have to call my grand sponsor and my sponsor on it several times, but I don't always have to say what I feel. Feelings aren't facts. So thank God for AA, and thank God for all of you. Thanks. Our second 10-minute speaker is Kent. Hi, everybody. My name is Kent, and I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is 122.05. My home group is 79th Street Workshop. I have a sponsor in AA. He had a sponsor. His sponsor had a sponsor, and so it goes. Um, I'd like to say thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight to everybody here at the Atlantic Group. Um, yeah, I used to think my story was uh, the most unique thing in the world. And the more time I put between my last drunk, uh, I realized that I'm pretty much just a garden variety drunk. Uh, so how I got here, um, I had my first drink when I was 12 years old. Uh, it wasn't too much different than other stories that I've heard. But for me, it was a, it was a life changing experience. I realized, uh, somewhere before I started throwing up in the, in the bushes that, uh, you know, this was, uh, I could understand why people would be homeless. I could understand that I didn't need to really achieve anything. You know, my drive for achievement was over with because all I needed was a bottle. If I could feel this good, um, I really didn't need to, to aspire to much more. And, uh, you know, I remember, um, you know, in the foggy hangover the next day, um, thinking, man, that's really what I want to do. I want to do that as often as possible. So I pretty much pretty much marked my uh, adolescent years. I, you know, drank as often as possible. And, you know, it's not surprising that by the time I was 18, I was a daily drinker. Um, stole a, a car from a fraternity brother, promptly wrecked it into a tree, went through the windshield, injured another guy. And the only consequences I paid for that was they threw a keg party for me. Um, you know, so by the time I'm 25, I'm a daily blackout drinker. Um, I don't have a whole lot of job prospects. Uh, I got married to wife number one. Uh, she was pregnant. And, uh, uh, you know, she said to me, I've watched you try and control your drinking. I've watched you try and moderate. You can't do it. You need to quit drinking or I'm leaving with this kid. And I got scared. And I got scared enough to go to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in June of 1987. Um, you know, and I was not a big third tradition kind of a guy. I didn't have a desire to stop drinking. I had a desire for people to leave me alone, for my life to get better. Um, I thought I was a pretty smart guy that I'd be able to work this whole like clubhouse serenity thing they got going on and still be able to um, get you know get a drink. And uh, you know there was an old timer there that said uh, one way that people will probably quit picking on you is if you go to a meeting a day and you don't drink between meetings, at least for the first 90 days. And, you know, it seemed to make sense. So, yeah, I took his advice. I didn't, uh, I didn't drink between meetings. By the time I got 90 days, um, you know, I could think a lot better. Um, but things still weren't going all that good. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, to hook up with a younger guy in the rooms. We played a lot of golf together. Both of us were unemployed. Um, but he had a lot more time than I did. And, uh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't about getting a sponsor. I wasn't about, uh, reading the big book. I figured that if uh, the steps were on the wall and I went to a meeting a day and I read the steps, that was as good as working them. And, 
he suggested maybe I, you know, if I was going to go to a meeting a day and raise my hand, I might want to have a little bit idea what I'm talking about. So he gave me my first big book. And we read the first 164 pages, and before I knew it, I was working the steps, and by the time I got to the third step, my life got a lot better. For the first time in my life, I think, at that point, I was able to be comfortable in my own skin without uh, without taking a drink. And uh, from there, I realized that, uh, you know, up to that time, I hadn't lost a lot of things like the older guys in AA, but what I had missed out on were a lot of real good opportunities. And I had a resolve that I wanted to take advantage of new opportunities as they came up. Um, so, you know, in sobriety, that first time around, I went back to college, uh, multiple bachelor's degrees, uh, became a registered nurse. Um, life was going really good. After about nine years, life was going so good. If you were to ask me on the day that I picked up that drink, I would have told you everything was perfect. It was so good that I was pretty much convinced that I could probably handle a drink. So I picked up a drink, and I spent the next eight and a half years losing all the things that I had, uh, that I had managed to get through those new opportunities. I lost my nursing license, multiple trips to rehab, uh, multiple trips in and out of the rooms. I was the guy that was always coming back saying I got one day back. Um, somehow or another, I mean, I moved around a lot in that time. Uh, did a lot of geographics. I lived in uh, Florida, Ohio, Arizona, Alaska, and finally ended up in Mississippi working in a casino. Um, Mississippi was ideal for me at that time. I could get booze 24-7. I worked in a casino. I got my booze at work for free. Um, there was a number of uh, casinos between the casino I worked at and my home. Uh, so my typical day there, I was on wife number four at this time. Um, my typical day there would be I would get up sometime in the afternoon, about two or three in the afternoon, so I could be to work at four. And my wife would plead with me, you're coming home from work tonight, hon? And honestly most honest thing in the world is I'd say, yeah, I'm coming home from work tonight. It's not going to be like the last 47 days in a row where I get stuck up in some casino. And I would mean it. And I'd get to work. Well, actually, before I got to work, I'd stop by one of the drive through daiquiri shops and pick up a diesel 190 made with grain alcohol. And, uh, you know, just to take the edge off. I didn't consider that drinking. And I get to uh, I get to work in the casino, and you know I had a pretty good job. I was a uh, um, a shift credit manager at the Beau Rivage, so I wore a suit and tie, and I had a regular hairstyle. And uh, you know, about four hours into my shift, I'd be looking at that clock. The shakes would be coming on, and uh, I'd be desperate for a drink. And most times, more times than not, I wouldn't be able to make it through the shift without uh, sneaking a drink at the bar. And eventually, that was the demise of that job. Um, you know, and then I had all those casinos I had to pass by on the way home, and I'd stop in for one. And usually about 9 o'clock in the morning, my wife would come and drag me out of a casino, and I did it again. And I had absolutely meant that I wasn't, uh, that I was going to come straight home from work that night. So that's uh, pretty much where alcohol took me. Somehow or another, I ended up here in New York City in a blackout. I used to do a lot of really good thinking in a blackout. And the last thought that I had in a blackout was that I would come to New York City and be a record producer. And keep in mind, I've never produced a record in my entire life. <laughs> so I ended up here in uh, New York City, and within three weeks, I was in Metropolitan Hospital going through the DTs. Um, I went to a rehab. When I got to that rehab, I had about three weeks of clean time, which was the most time I had had in the last five years. And I realized, you know, I used to be a registered nurse. I could probably own one of these rehabs. So that was my goal. That was what I was going to do to stay sober, was I was going to open up a franchise of uh, rehabs. And uh, suffice it to say, within 30 days of getting out of that place, I was back in Metropolitan going through the DTs again. I went to another uh, rehab. And this is just ongoing strings of rehabs. And I don't know what happened in that one, but about two weeks into that one, when I could think clear again, um, you know, I really realized that uh, my life was about as unmanageable as it could be, and I didn't know a solution. I went to sleep, woke up the next morning, and it's just like the second step says. Nobody told me how to believe in a higher power. I just came to believe that there was a power greater than myself that could restore me to sanity, and I've held on to that to this day. Um, it was like a great burden had been lifted. 
I didn't have to think my way through the problems. I had a higher power that would be able to do that for me. And from there, I've latched onto that. You know, I, uh, I got back into the steps. Um, today, I've, my sponsor has instilled in me that my primary purpose in life, no matter what I do for a living or pay my bills, my primary purpose every time I get up in the morning is to stay sober and help another alcoholic. And I try and take that to, an, like, not really the next level, but, you know, I firmly believe that if I'm sober, I'm leaving the world a little bit better place than I found it. Because when I was drinking, I certainly left it a lot worse than I found it. Um, and so, um, so today, um, that is, every morning that I wake up, I turn my will and my life over to the care of God. I hold on to that desperately. And uh, I do my best to uh, leave the world a little better place than I found it. And I've got a lot of love for AA. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Melissa. I'm an alcoholic. It's an honor and privilege to be here tonight. I'd like to thank Helen for asking me to speak. Uh, my sobriety date is November 7th, 1990. I, I go to High Noon downtown. My sponsor is named Michael. He's a neuroscientist at Columbia University. I don't know what that means either. He works with rats. We have great conversations. I went to the eye doctor today. I cannot see. I can see about 10 feet. You are a very attractive blur. <laughs> if I know you and don't say hello, please don't take it personally. And so what the doctor talks about goes, well, this is going to be very simple. In two weeks, I'm going to have an operation. And then he goes and tells me what this means. And it involves things, slitting eyeballs. And the more I listen, he gets excited. I get nervous, uncomfortable, frightened, very uneasy. And then I remember, nothing could be more difficult or uncomfortable than when I stopped drinking and came here. That was a problem. Since then, in recovery, I've had good days and I've had learning experiences. <laughs> the good days are great. The learning experiences are my qualification. Um, I was born in Manhattan. I grew up in Long Island. Uh, my, my grandfather drinks a lot. My mother is a social drinker. She drinks socially every day. <laughs> my younger brother still drinks. I don't know how he does it. He's lost everything. He's lost his home. He's lost his family. He's lost his business. My heart goes out to him. I bleed a little for him every day. Um, I don't know how he does it. Um, when I was a child, I was baffled. Absolutely 100% baffled. I saw what the other kids were doing, didn't get it at all. And so what I did is I watched. And I'm clever. That hasn't really helped me much, but I'm clever. And I watched them, and so I learned to do what the other kids did. Um, at a very early age, I became a world-class liar. I was the best. My lies were so good, I believed them. I don't think my mother ever did, but... As I got older, though, the lying began to not work, and I just became so uncomfortable. Um, when I was a kid, I played sports. I was a very good, very good athlete, a varsity athlete in school, and that was great for a while, too. Eventually, though, um, at a certain point, I started to drink. I was a teenager. What teenagers do, teenagers drink. And um, I drank a lot. And... I was really awkward and nervous. It didn't make me less awkward and nervous. I just didn't care as much. Um, and that was a pattern that stayed with me for the next 20 years. It never changed anything other than I just stopped caring. Uh, in high school, I had the reputation for being a big drinker. I was cast in a school play as a drunk, and everyone laughed at that. They thought that was amusing. Uh, college, I drank every day. I uh, drank myself to sleep every night. I, I drank so much I was even aware of it, and I was 21 at the time. And um, I would have blackouts, and I would shake a lot, and I didn't really go to class much. And I went to four different schools, and eventually I even got a degree. I tried to go to graduate school. That didn't work. I, I, I figured I would... I would rather go up and be a, an alcoholic instead. For all of you that have had great success as alcoholics, I 
I am so thrilled. That's something I could not do. I'm a garden variety drunk. My life has always been small. It's never really led to anything. I always thought, well, I'm really bright. Something will happen. And the only thing that happened is I drank myself to sleep. And nothing ever happened. And as a result, I grew up angry, bitter, cynical, and very frustrated. Uh, my father taught me a cynic as someone who knows the, uh, uh, the price of everything and the value of nothing. What had happened is, I would say, I, I, after graduate school, I go, I'm so old, I'm single. Where do old single people go? I know, I'll go back to New York. <laughs> I was 24 at the time. Um, <laughs> and so this started, I, I moved into a lovely little apartment in Queens, and um, I found bars to hang out in, and in, in those days, I had car, a car. They, they let me on the road with a car. And those of us that drank outside of Manhattan know all those great drunken driving stories. And it was horrendous, really. And uh, uh, I, I played pinball with my car, a big car, knock off other cars, accidents, terrible things. Um, and I knew I began to realize that I have a problem here. This is not really the way it's supposed to be. I used to black out. I would, sometimes I would come to, it would be a terrible thing. I would go out, I would go to, uh, I would start drinking at midnight. I would drink milk because drinking is good. It coats the stomach. And then I would go out and drink. I, after the milk, I would have a few drinks at home just to make sure it gets started quickly. And then I would go out and, um, and, I would black out and I'd have my car and so um, I would go to the bar then I would go to the after hours club. The after hours club today is where the midnight meeting is and I've, I'm always shocked that the building got sober before I did. Um, it was a notorious place though. Um, and I sometimes I would wake up and I would be in the car, sometimes I'd wake up in the bar, sometimes I'd wake up in the car in front of the house, sometimes I'd be in bed, that would mean the rest of the day would be walking around looking for the car. Sometimes I'd wake up in someone else's bed, different part of town, different part of the city, different state. And I knew I had a problem. It was becoming obvious. And so happily I found my perfect solution to alcoholism, and that was cocaine. Now I can drink the way I want to. Um, Within three years, I, I had done my best, and everything was gone. And um, I did a life of many geographics, like Kent was talking about. And I ended up living overseas for three years. And it was great. I was in an overseas construction project, believe it or not. And um, and we were living in the desert, and the, the bar was 100 yards away, no cars. Problem is, I, I used to drink and never wake up for work. And you can't call in sick when you... The office is 100 yards away. They come banging on the door. <laughs> and of course, the first hour, I couldn't do anything. My hands shook too much, you know, and this before computers. And I would just sit there. But who's attracted to a job like this? Well, other alcoholics. So everyone sits there just shaking. <laughs> I didn't drive the heavy machinery, though. I just worked in the office. Um, it was great. I was able to pay off all my debts, and uh, I was able to come home. And um, and I looked very, very, very hard for the lowest paying job I could find. It takes a lot of effort and energy to, to find, find jobs that don't pay a livable wage. I put a lot of effort, have a lifetime of jobs like that. And uh, it wasn't long before I was in desperate trouble. And um, my drinking when I was in my mid-30s was to the point of, um, I was living in Woodside and um, I stopped drinking in public. Why pay all those retail prices? And uh, and I would drink at home and, um, you know, I never drank in the morning except, of course, when the, 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 uh, not, the nighttime ended and it was daytime and there's nothing like standing at a bodega when everyone's buying coffee for work and I'm buying another six-pack. Um, and things just got horrible. And 
I was a disaster. I once spoke to my mother and father on the phone, and my tone frightened them so much they drove in from Long Island because they thought I was going to hurt myself. And at this point, my clothes were in shambles. I was unkempt. I I had picked up a roommate. Um, I don't. She, she was a transsexual prostitute. Um, she asked if she could live there. I said no. She asked if she could store her stuff there because she had already lost her place. I said okay, and she never left. So now I had a roommate. I'd go to work in the day. She returned tricks. Um, and just things got horrible. And uh, I owed everyone money. And I used to go up and down Roosevelt Avenue in Queens. And um, and each of the different vendors and store owners I owed money to. And um, and eventually the, the stress of debt was too much for me. And um, I stopped paying my bills. It'll be okay. I'm a nice person. And, um, and then I stopped paying rent. And there was always something that seemed more important to me. And this is this is where my thinking got to me. And finally, I get a phone call from Miss Taxi, and it's like they're here and they're locking up the place and they're taking everything. And so here I am. I'm in my mid-thirties. I'm a a mid-level manager in a corporation. I hang up the phone, and it's like, my God, I've got no place to go after work. And so that day was pouring, and so the city was storing all their stuff in in Harlem. So I take the train up to Harlem. My shoes had holes in them, so I'd cardboard in the bottom so my socks wouldn't get wet. And I go there with plastic bags, and here I am. And here's all my stuff just stacked in the corner. And um, so I filled up my plastic bags, you know, my flip-flops, all the basics. And that was it. And I never saw any of that stuff again, and I went home. I told my my parents that, that I'm having a problem. And, um, and they said, well... You can stay with us if you go to rehab. And so none of us knew anything about this. So we got out the phone book and we start to go to rehabs and we start alphabetically. We get to Beth Israel. And it's like, great, I'll go there. Maybe there are Jews there. <laughs> so I went to Beth Israel. There were not. Um, <laughs> funny thing is, the real funny thing is I was born in Beth Israel. So I've been both born and reborn. I loved rehab. Rehab was the greatest. I got to eat and I got to sleep, two things I hadn't been doing much about. If you ever have to go to rehab, sit next to the heroin addicts. They're much too sick to eat. <laughs> rehab did not get me sober. I had to do more research. And so what would happen... I learned about recovery. I learned, I got my first big book. I learned about AA. They'd have all these great speakers come in. And it was just so wonderful. You know, it was really inspirational. It's a lot easier to stay sober when you live in a locked ward than it is in the real world. Um, but the one lesson they said, go to meetings. They, they repeated it a thousand times. And um, I was terrified. A life without alcohol to me just seemed like permanent parole. And I left, and I went to meetings, and it was amazing, really. I, it was just the most amazing thing. The people were really nice and friendly. The lights were very bright, though. I wasn't used to that. Uh, I, when I counted days, and the speaker and the secretary remembered my name. I, it was, I hadn't been a part of anything. The small group of people that, that I had hung out with, of, Three of us got sober and one of us is dead. So that's probably pretty much a lot of people. Um, my first relapse was about in six weeks. Then it was four weeks, three weeks, two weeks. Uh, my first relapse was at Shea Stadium. We had the company seats. The beer vendors knew that when I sat down, I needed two big beers to start the game. And so they came running over and I said, what the hell? And, um, and so began, I counted days for nine months. Uh, I was really bad at it. Uh, every day of the week, I'd have a different day count. Sometimes I'd go to meetings in the city, sometimes in Long Island. A lifetime of honesty, what? I stopped drinking and magically become honest? Not my story. Um, so I, I, I got so confused by my day counts, you used to have to write them all down so I could remember them. Um, and it wasn't working. <laughs> and it wasn't working. And it was awful. And... AA is about not drinking. And so, you know, to 
to be that great liar whose lies even I believe, it just doesn't work. And um, and I got sadder and more unhappy. And and I asked people about getting sober. And I heard a variety of things. One of the best things I went to uh, St. Martin's out at Bethpage, right across from Grumman, and an older man there. And he, and he says, "What's the matter? You look so unhappy." And, well, I relapsed again. I've got three days. And his face just lit up lit up completely and says, I'm so happy you're here. Just remember that God loves you. Um, God was never much a part of my past. And you know what? That was like 17 years ago. His name was John. I'll never forget him. And if that's what it takes to have me try and to keep coming back. I went to my normal groups and on Tuesday I said, I have two days. I never had one day. I, I didn't have the guts for that. And then Wednesday I had three days. And Thursday... I had four days. And in spite of it, in spite of that anger, that rottenness inside me, by following your example, I actually started to get sober. Truly miraculous. Um, I didn't know what to do. After 30 days, I was going to meetings. I was living with my mom and dad. I, nothing, I was over 40 living with my parents. Um, and I didn't know what to do. And there was a guy at the meetings who goes, service keeps you sober, service keeps you sober. So, you know, I, I could see the, the steps on the wall. I, I, I could see that, that people talking about God. And, and it's like, well, you know what? I'm sure everyone wants to do service, but I'm going to see if I can do it. And the meetings I was going to, no one was doing service. Um, that's why this is such an amazing group. Thank you. And I started to do service. My first service was at a big event, a big social event. Don't let me near people. So they had me in the back chopping salad. So here I am, 28 days, they give me a knife about this big. <laughs> so there I am, chopping lettuce. That was my first service. Um, and it was New Year's Eve, and it kept me sober for the first time in many years. And that New Year's Eve, I stayed sober. Me and my big knife. And, uh, <laughs> and after that, I figured, you know, mostly I saw people, you know, pass the baskets. It's like, what's with all the money, you know? <laughs> and so at the business meeting, they're looking for people to help out. It's like, okay, well, I can help out. You know, in those days, it was great. One of my favorite jobs I had was um, cleaning ashtrays. And, uh, and that was just so cool. The, the meetings... Big cups of coffee, huge ashtrays, they were hoot. And um, I was desperate and pretty crazy. And um, and I figured Miss Thing could use a little humility. And cleaning ashtrays seemed just about the thing. And um, I used to go to meetings, and and I hated God. I was I was with my friend Sam on the way over, and and I said, boy, when I you know when I came to rooms, I hated God today. I have no idea what that was about. I can't even remember. But it was really important then. And and I would go to the, these meetings and, and they all talk about God. And it's like, uh. And then they start with the Lord's Prayer. It's like, wait a minute, I'm Jewish. I don't say the Lord. And I looked around and all the other Jewish people were sober saying the Lord's Prayer. My Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It will be done. You know, as as when I was younger, I used to argue about God and God's place in your life and mind. And you know what? I'm over 40. I'm homeless. I'm living with my parents. I lost my job. Now is not a good time to debate the existence of God. <laughs> what they told me is act as if. That I can do. I can pretend. And it's worked out. I am, I have a PhD in the first step. You know, I'm great at not picking up. The rest, that striving for perfection, I like it, you know, but it's going to take more time. And, uh, but I'm willing to do it. I, I would see people that, you know, stick with the winners, right? And, and there are these people that, were amazing and had amazing lives and all they did was keep coming, have a sponsor, work steps, get involved, help out. You know, it, it's, it isn't, I, you know, it, this is a simple program for complicated people. I am a complicated person and it was easy enough for me to keep coming. Um, 
you know, I, my first year was awful. My second year was horrific. My third year was a disaster. But I kept coming, you know. <laughs> I've, when I stopped drinking, I thought my life would fall apart. I was right. It did. <laughs> Completely. But I kept coming back. And um, my friend Mark R. is here tonight, my oldest friend in recovery, who I love dearly. And, and you know, I, the second step came to believe it's like, well, if all of you are doing it and staying sober, then, then I can too. And the third step, making that decision to turn over your will. I never knew I had a will. Now that I know I have it, I have to give it away. And so I struggled with the third step. And the fourth step, my resentment list, it only had 85 names. I was over 40. I thought that was pretty good. Mark R. had gotten to the point, I love you, Melissa, please do a fourth step. I, when I get tired of my inventory, I'd start in on yours. <laughs> and eventually, in spite of everything, by doing what you do, by doing it the way you do it, I got sober. My life became stable. I will say... Um, and we have, they said, no major changes the first year, figuring, well, not drinking, you know, that's a lot. And I said, okay, okay. My first year I changed sex. Um, I would say, as an adult, the first half I was male, the second half I've been female. It's a very interesting story for another time. Um, <laughs> my sponsor was not pleased. Uh, <laughs> In spite of everything, I got sober. I'm friendly. I'm helpful. I've had a, a slew of sponsees through the years. Three of them, you know, people come to meetings like this. Well, my sponsor told me to come. Actually, it was my sponsees that told me to come. I mean, Anthony is here, and Jeff and Ryan, who no longer comes to meetings. And they all told me to come here because I was getting so frustrated with the meetings I had been going to. And to come here in this big room with all you nice people. And um, be nice to the newcomers. Someday they may be your sponsor. And, uh, <laughs> and I learn a lot from all my friends in recovery. And, uh, today in my life I am stable. Um, I'm less angry. I, I have my moments. You know, I, I have character defects, and they come up in a myriad of ways. I, I'm pretty impatient, you know. And, you know, when I, when I was active, I was got in trouble for a million things. I, I struggling with money. I struggling with all sorts of issues, you know. And I was told if you take care of the little things, the big things take care of themselves. And I can tell you that that's what's happened to me. And. Uh, I don't live with my mom and dad anymore. Um, I, I own my own little home out in Queens. And uh, and I got caught stealing petty cash at my corporate job in the 80s. I'm a director at a credit union. I have the keys. Um, I got a phone call. You know, I the ability to do service, you know, I've done everything AA is, can ask. I've, I've even gone in, to California. I've done world service conferences and things. and. Um, but helping other people has been just so awesome, you know. And, and in the end, you know, I'm I'm just a drunk with a job, and you know, and, and a program, and it's worked for me. And and people seem to like it. And I've helped a lot of people. Some people I've I've been more successful than others. A couple of years ago, I was in a movie, right? What a hoot! So beyond your wildest dreams, right? Um, I got a phone call from an ex sponsee. She's in Florida. She was schizophrenic. I didn't know that when she became my sponsee. More interesting stories. And I would say something. I thought that would be something I've heard a thousand times in meetings, and it went over very badly with her. Um, but she had a very different reality. So she called in tears. She saw the movie. She, she just wanted to tell me that she just celebrated seven years of sobriety. And you know what? If Miss Margarita can have seven years of sobriety with her alternate reality, you know, this is a program that works. I wish it would work for everyone, you know. And again, I, I bring you back to the sadness in my heart for my brother. And um, 
I am planning our old age together. I haven't seen him in 18 years, you know, and I speak to him occasionally since my dad died. And he's not real happy about this. And it's like, I don't want you to be homeless. He's virtually homeless as it is. And um, so we're going to get old together. I am. Hopefully he will be lucky and, uh, and survive also. I love AA. Everything I am is because of AA and because of the lessons I've learned from people like you. Um, I know other people do other things. God bless them all, you know. Uh, I have a great relationship with my higher power. Mostly, I amuse my higher power. Um, <laughs> my higher power doesn't care if I drink. When I drink, then I miss God's love, you know. And then, you know, God is God. God has a lot going on. And if I'm drinking, then I'm, I'm the one who's alone and isolated and afraid and detached and not knowing right from left. I decided a long time ago that I was going to stick around and take as much from AA as I can. It's, now it's reasonably inexpensive. Let me tell you about the old days. But whatever you want to offer, I'll take, you know, because I figured there's always something I could learn from it. And... Um, I'm just so grateful for, for my friends and my, and my sponsor and my sponsees to help get me to this moment uh, to, to learn about the big book, to learn about our steps of recovery, to be able to help other people. My, my guideline is the St. Francis Prayer in the 11th step. You know, I'm, you know I, I've been very inspired. When I, I've done a lot of service in AA, and then, well, it's sort of egoless, and I've got a little bit of an ego. So I, I've started to branch out with my service, and I've done community service, and now I'm doing, and it's been cool. I, four years ago, I was one of your representatives at the Democratic National Convention in Boston, so um, be afraid. So, uh, <laughs> but I still do service. I'm the, I, I do service. At, I'm usually, I've done um, hospitality. I've done the uh, sponsorship. I been doing that on and off for a few years. Now I'm the treasurer of my home group. So uh, I owe everything to you and to AA, and um, thank you for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.